What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Live Corporate, and yeah, it's a Saturday. I'm here uh, talking to you. Um, as you know, the Living Corporate exists to amplify and center marginalized voices at work. Um, I believe that we're one of the few spaces that does that uh, in a consistently intentional way by having black and brown voices, including uh, my daughter, who's in the background. As y'all know, that she's uh, she's a, a new co-host of the pod (laughs) oh man keep it in keep it in keep it in because we're we're talking about life actually typically you hear Letitia Bird with link up with Letitia or you'll hear Amy C. Weininger from the see it to be it series but I wanted to one give our team a bit of a mental and emotional break this week and do a bit of a like a state of the pod more of a current events type episode today so I'm gonna be rocking with y'all for just a little bit Um, not too long Um, as I really seek to get some uh, mental restoration myself. So let's get started with just like the recent deaths that we've been forced to engage and encounter through social media or through closer circles. So we have George Floyd, Regis Korchinski, Paquette, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, and then uh, of course, Breonna Taylor, all senselessly murdered by the hands of the state. And it's just another set of black bodies brutalized for no other reason than just existing. Right. Like brutalized by the state and or killed and then covered up and supported by the state, to be clear, because Ahmaud Arbery was not killed by police. But the legal system failed and was forced to come back to the table after being pressured and shamed through social media. You know, it's challenging for me to do this work, and I think it's challenging for us and just black folks some people say being black is exhausting and and that's true in that being black is exhausting in the fact that we have to deal with white systems that continually oppress and harm us and for the white systems that are harming us or the white folks who aren't being maliciously intentional about it then you have a whole nother set of people who are just being complicit in it and that they are too lazy to figure out ways to engage honestly and openly about the problems You then, of course, have a portion of people who are really engaged in seeking to be allies. I'm going to talk to you all in a minute as well. But, you know, when it comes to George Floyd specifically, I knew of George. I knew of George because George, he was a part of a church plant that came out of a former mentor and colleague. And we had very similar circles, uh, ministry circles. And so I recall helping them set up a church service because George was very active in the community. He was a man of love and peace. And I remember seeing him, I remember seeing him at that church service because he was helping with the chairs and he was talking to the people. And I mean, he was, again, he was a man of the community. He was in his community. And so knowing that he was just the degree of separation is just so small. Not only that, but he was murdered in Minnesota. My father and my stepmother and my siblings and my step grandmother and my, and I have cousins and aunts who live in Minnesota. And an uncle, too. I have family up there, like very close, very, very close to where George was murdered. And so, you know, I'm seeing a lot of folks question the rioting that's happening. And what I really want to do is talk about, you know, the systemic challenges and reasons as to why people riot. And as you look at just kind of like the system of oppression and why these things continue to happen. But instead, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to actually read this piece, this excerpt from King. A lot of people have been saying, you know, the rise language of the unheard, like they, they, they take a piece of King of that quote. And like we mostly do with King, like we'll like boil down these beautiful pieces of what he's saying into something like a soundbite. Um, it's disrespectful to his legacy. It's disrespectful to uh, to his genius. I want to read it in totality and then we can kind of we can go on from there. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear is failed to hear the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. It is and it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And in so a real sense, our nation's summers are of riots 
are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. And so I think what people miss the most about King is a lot of folks, they just use King as a cudgel to shame and shut up black voices as they grow discontented with the reality of America. And what I think what's the biggest challenge, right? As it comes to like this D E I work is that there's a bunch of folks in this space for reasons that have nothing to do with black equity that have nothing to do with justice that have nothing to do with actual equality, but has more to do with creating false peace and in so doing, they recenter themselves, they recreate or they reestablish the very systems that silence and mute and discourage black thought and black and brown voices. And they create unto themselves fiefdoms of thought leadership that have really nothing to do with anything tangible. We are in the middle of a racist cold war and it has everything to do with white America's reluctance to face itself. It's neglected itself. It's neglected its own humanity in as much as it's neglected its black brother and sister. It's coming to a head and it's going to continue to surface. I mean, the fact that I'm able to quote a quote that's over 50 years old and yet it's just as pertinent now, I think what we have to ask ourselves is what does it really look like to create and pursue justice? Um, And those words are scary for white people in the context of race, despite our obsession with justice in media, right? We love law and order, criminal intent, elementary NCIS, like the list goes on and on. We love cops. Um, We love justice when we are on the dispensary end but no one wants to rush to be on the other end of justice. And the fact that white America is so terrified of justice really is a indicator as to the extent and depths of their crimes. And that's what makes this work hard. Being a black person, being a black man, and like even being a cis, (laughs) a cis hetero black, large Christian man makes this work challenging. We're at a crossroads, though, where esoteric language that really isn't approachable or doesn't mean anything. We're just past that. Right? We're coming up on a national election and the likelihood is that there's going to be another black and brown person, a woman, a trans woman, a trans man, a cishet man, black man body. There's going to be someone else who's going to be brutalized by police this year. The statistics show it. And so we're at a fever pitch. But things have to change. I mean, so with that being said, I want to talk about white response. Right. So there are folks who listen to this podcast regularly who consider themselves allies by various measures. I'm not here to really judge the veracity of your claim. I I will give you some points of advice, though, as you ask yourself what it is you can do today. I'll start with this. I've seen a lot of things on social media around I'm checking in on your uh, people of color, colleagues. I'm going to say, don't do that. Uh, It's unpopular position, I'm sure, but don't do that. If you're listening to this and you and I are friends and you are white, don't check in on me. I have people that look like me. I have my family, I have my friends, I have my daughter, I have my wife, um, I have my parents, I have my cousins. Like I have people that can empathize and support me in a unique way because of their joint shared lived experience. And I'm not really looking for your words right now. I say that with love. I'm not mad. Right. I'm just I'm trying to be honest that I'm not looking for your words right now. I'm looking for your actions. So what you can do and who you can check in on are your white colleagues, your white family members, your white friends, your white. Again, I know I said family, but parents like check in on the folks that, you know, don't understand, don't engage and don't listen or believe the reality of black and brown people in America. Check in on your boss. 
the people who actually have access and power. If you actually have access to power, check in on yourself. Ask yourself, what are you doing to help improve the experience of the people that you work with? How can you leverage your voice and your power, the power that comes with that voice, the political capital that comes with your skin to advocate and support others? My frustration kind of like when I think about this space is that, you know, we talk a lot online, but, you know, online gives a bit of a mask. And I'm not going to say the person who who said this, but I, I recall I wrote something I wrote. I wrote something about white welfare. I wrote it on Martin Luther King Day and the person who I was speaking with shared that, you know, they, they thought it was good, but they felt it was a little uncomfortable and they would alienate their audience. Their audience is predominantly white people. But what they would do while they wouldn't email it to their newsletter or promote it on their website or promote it on LinkedIn, they would tweet it because they could get away with it, quote unquote, on Twitter. That's not what I'm looking for. And that's not what black and brown people look. We're not looking for you to figure out the lowest stakes possible. We're looking for you to actually commit something. We're looking for you to say something, We're looking for you to do something. Um, we're exhausted. And frankly, like a lot of these efforts to reach out to people of color, to black and brown people is oftentimes an exercise in your own ego and guilt. I'm not looking to assuage um, or to comfort or stroke your ego or massage your guilt. I don't care. I don't. I, I genuinely don't care. And I'm, I'm giving you this as a gift because the people that are in your circles probably won't tell it to you like this. But I'm telling you as a favor. So you're welcome. So that's that's a white response at like an individual level. Let's talk about at an organizational level. So there are a lot of organizations right now who feel stuck and paralyzed and figuring out what does they need to do, how they need to respond. Again, the 45th, 65th email, if you're the kind of company that sends these out often, is going to really create, I believe, more frustrations than it will uh, relief. I would ask um, if you're an executive or someone in a position of like, organizational power, like you manage a PL or something like that, just ask yourself what systems exist today that harm and disenfranchise the folks on the margins. Ask yourself what new policies need to be erected to protect those who are most vulnerable. And ask yourself, what are you doing as a leader to drive equity within your immediate team. You know, these are the types of things that we have to get to. It's about taking your own medicine of accountability. And the funny thing is, because of the way that white supremacy is set up, if you do it right, you can do all of this and still be hailed as a hero. Right. Yeah, you're going to lose some relationships because so there's going to be some folks who don't want you to do this. I'm talking to the people who actually care. But for the organizations that care, if you do it right, you can market this and be a hero. There's a lot to think about right now in this time. Folks are exhausted. Um, there's all types of implications and things that we'll continue to talk about on Living Corporate uh, regarding like just the mental health implications and the. Uh, I mean, we didn't even talk about the reality of coronavirus and how it's been disproportionately impacting uh, and killing black and brown people. Um, I can tell you that while no one in my immediate circle has died, I've had some friends who have come close. It's just a tough time and we're in a crossroads with diversity, equity, and inclusion work. You're either going to kind of toe the line and continue to alienate and drive away black and brown folks. Maybe that's, maybe that's what you want to do. You know, like maybe there's like a long play for you to say we tried, but it's easy for you just to not do. It. You can say that nothing's changed, but you tried, you know, maybe that's the route you want to take. But if you're looking to really engage this future workforce and retain talent and not only retain them, but keep them at their best, there are some things about the way that you think about this work that we think about this work collectively it's going to have to fundamentally change my ask is that if you're a white diversity equity and inclusion leader you listen to this ask yourself how you can decenter yourself in your own efforts you should not be the face of your diversity equity and inclusion work you shouldn't i know it's a wildly unpopular position but you shouldn't think about ways you can empower the folks that don't look like you to drive change they know better than you what it means to be equitable and inclusive so with that i am wrapping up lower different energy podcast today i recognize but 
I hope that the folks listening to this, my black and brown brothers and sisters, that you take care of yourself, protect your peace at work, take off time, communicate to your diversity, equity, inclusion leader, whoever that may be about your mental health. Take the time off that you need. Trust me, companies are incentivized right now to not deny you time off if you're in such a blessed position to have PTO. Till next time, y'all. It's been Zach. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.